Section 23 of The South Pole. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dick Durrett. The South Pole by Roald Amundsen. Translation by A. G. Carter. Section 23, Volume 2, Chapter 11, Through the Mountains, Part 1. On the following day, November 17, we began the ascent. To provide for any contingency, I left in the depot a paper with information of the way we intended to take through the mountains, together with our plan for the future, our outfit, provisions, and so forth. The weather was fine, planned for the, as usual, and the going good. The dogs exceeded our expectations. They negotiated the two fairly steep slopes at a jog trot. We began to think there was no difficulty they could not surmount. The five miles or so that we had gone the day before and imagined would be more than enough for this day's journey, were now covered with full loads in shorter time. The small glaciers higher up turned out fairly steep, and in some places we had to take two sledges at a time with double teams. These glaciers had an appearance of being very old and of having entirely ceased to move. There were no new crevices to be seen. Those that were there were large and wide, but their edges were rounded off everywhere, and the crevices themselves were almost entirely filled with snow. So as not to fall into these on the return, <coughs> we erected our beacons in such a way that the line between any two of them would take us clear of any danger. It was no use working in polar clothing among these hills. The sun, which stood high and clear, was uncomfortably warm, and we were obliged to take off most of our things. We passed several summits from 3,000 to 7,000 feet high. The snow on one of them had quite a reddish-brown tint. Our distance this first day was eleven and a half miles with a rise of two thousand feet. Our camp that evening lay on a little glacier among huge crevices. On three sides of us were towering summits. When we had set our tent, two parties went out to explore the way in advance. One party, Wisting and Hansen, took the way that looked easiest from the tent, namely, the course of the glacier. It here rose rapidly to 4,000 feet and disappeared in a southwesterly direction between two peaks. Jarland formed the other party. He evidently looked upon this ascent as too tame and started up the steepest part of the mountain side. I saw him disappear up aloft like a fly. Hassel and I attended to the necessary work round about and in the tent. We were sitting inside chatting when we suddenly heard someone come swishing down towards the tent. We looked at each other. That fellow had some pace on. He had no doubt as to who it was, Jarlan. Of course, he must have gone off to refresh old memories. He had a lot to tell us. Amongst other things, he had found the finest descent on the other side. What he meant by fine, I was not certain. If it was as fine as the ascent he had made, then I asked to be excused. We now heard the others coming, and these we could hear a long way off. They had also seen a great deal, not to mention the finest descent.
but both parties agreed in the mournful intelligence that we should have to go down again. They had both observed the immense glacier that stretched beneath us running east and west. A lengthy discussion took place between the two parties, who mutually scorned each other's discoveries. Yes, but look here, Bijalan, we could see that from where you were standing there's a sheer drop. You couldn't see me at all, I tell you. I was to the west of the peak that lies to the south of the peak that I gave up trying to follow the discussion any longer. The way in which the different parties had disappeared and come in sight again gave me every reason to decide in favor of the route the last arrivals had taken. I thanked these keen gentlemen for their strenuous ramble in the interests of the expedition and went straight off to sleep. I dreamed of mountains and precipices all night and woke up with Bajanan whizzing down from the sky. I announced once more that I had made up my mind for the other course and went to sleep again. We debated next morning whether it would be better to take the sledges two by two to begin with. The glacier before us looked quite steep enough to require double teams. It had a rise of 2,000 feet and quite a short distance, but we would try first with a single teams. The dogs had shown that their capabilities were far above our expectation. Perhaps they would be able to do even this. We crept off. The ascent began at once. Good exercise after a quart of chocolate. We did not get on fast, but we won our way. It often looked as if the sledge would stop, but a shout from the driver and a sharp crack of the whip kept the dogs on the move. It was a fine beginning to the day, and we gave them a well-deserved rest when we got up. We then drove in through the narrow pass and out on the other side. It was a magnificent panorama that opened before us. From the pass we had come out onto a very small flat terrace, which a few yards farther on began to drop steeply, to a long valley. Round about us lay summit after summit on every side. We had now come behind the scenes and could get our bearings better. We now saw the southern side of the immense Mount Nansen. Don Pedro, Christopherson, we could see in his full length. Between these two mountains we could follow the course of a glacier that rose in terraces along their sides. It looked fearfully broken and disturbed, but we could follow a little connected line among the many crevices. We saw that we could go a long way, but we also saw that the glacier forbade us to use it in its full extent. Between the first and second terraces the ice was evidently impassable but we could see that there was an unbroken ledge upon the side of the mountain. Don Pedro would help us out. On the north, along the Nansen Mountain, there was nothing but chaos, perfectly impossible to get through. We put up a big beacon where we were standing and took bearings from it all round the compass. I went back to the pass to look out over the barrier for the last time. The new mountain chain lay there sharp and clear. We could see how it turned from the east up to east, northeast, and finally disappeared in the northeast. As we judged, about 84 degrees south, from the look of the sky it appeared that the chain was continued farther. According to the aneroid, the height of the terrace on which we stood was 4,000 feet above the sea. From here there was only one way down, and we began to go. In making these descents with loaded sledges, one has to use the greatest care.
lest the speed increase to such a degree that one loses command over the sledge. If this happens, there is a danger, not only of running over the dogs, but of colliding with the sledge in front and smashing it. This was all the more important in our case, as the sledges carried sledge meters. We therefore put brakes of rope under our runners when we were to go downhill. This was done very simply by taking a few turns with a thin piece of rope round each runner. The more of these turns one took, the more powerful, of course, was the brake. The art consisted of choosing the right number of turns or the right brake. This was not always attained, and the consequence was that before we had come to the end of these descents, there were several collisions. One of the drivers, in particular, seemed to have a supreme contempt for a proper break. He would rush down like a flash of lightning and carry the man in front with him. With practice, we avoided this, but several times things had an ugly look. The first drop took us down 800 feet, then we had to cross a wide, stiff piece of valley before the ascent began again. The snow between the mountains was loose and deep and gave the dogs hard work. The next ascent was up very steep glaciers, the last of which was the steepest bit of climbing we had on the whole journey. Stiff work even for double teams. Going in front of the dogs up these slopes was, I could see, a business that Jarland would accomplish far more satisfactorily than I, and I gave up the place to him. The first glacier was a steep, but the second was like the side of a house. It was a pleasure to watch Jarland use his ski up there. One could see that he had been up a hill before. Now was it less interesting to see the dogs and the drivers go up? Hansen drove one sledge alone, Whisting and Hassel the other. They went by jerks, foot by foot, and ended by reaching the top. The second relay went somewhat more easily in the tracks made by the first. Our height here was 4,550 feet, the last ascent having brought us up 1,250 feet. We had arrived on a plateau, and after the dogs had rested, we continued our march. Now, as we advanced, we had a better view of the way we were going. Before this, the nearest mountains had shut us in. The mighty glacier opened up before us, stretching, as we could now see, right up from the barrier between the lofty mountains running east and west. It was by this glacier that we should have to gain the plateau. We could see that. We had one more descent to make before reaching it, and from above we could distinguish the edges of some big gaps in this descent, and found it prudent to examine it at first. As we thought, there was a side glacier coming down into it with large, ugly crevices in many places, but it was not so bad as to prevent our finally reaching, with caution and using good brakes, the great main ice field, Axel Heiberg Glacier. The plan we had proposed to ourselves was to work our way up to the place where the glacier rose in abrupt masses between the two mountains. The task we had undertaken was greater than we thought. In the first place, the distance was three times as great as any of us had believed, and in the second place, the snow was so loose and deep that it was hard work for the dogs after all their previous efforts. We set out our course along the white line that we had been able to follow among the numerous crevices right up to the first terrace. Here tributary glaciers came down on all sides from the mountains and joined the main one. It was one of these small arms that we reached that evening directly under Don Pedro Christofferson.
The mountain below which we had our camp was covered with a chaos of immense blocks of ice, the glacier on which we were much broken up, but, as with all the others, the fissures were of old date and to a large extent drifted up. The snow was so loose that we had to trample a place for the tent and we could push the tent pole right down without meeting resistance. Probably it would be better higher up. In the evening, Hansen and Jarland went out to reconnoitre and found the conditions as we had seen them from a distance. The way up to the first terrace was easily accessible. What the conditions would be like between this and the second terrace we had still to discover. It was stiff work next day getting up to the first terrace. The arm of the glacier that led up was not very long, but extremely steep and full of big crevices. It had to be taken in relays, two sledges at a time. The state of the going was, fortunately, better than on the previous day, and the surface of the glacier was fine and hard, so that the dogs got a splendid hold. Jarland went up in advance through the steep glacier and had his work cut out to keep ahead of the eager animals. One would never have thought we were between 85 degrees and 86 degrees south. The heat was positively disagreeable, and although lightly clad, we sweated as if we were running races in the tropics. We were ascending rapidly, but in spite of the sudden change of pressure, we did not yet experience any difficulty of breathing, headache, or other unpleasant results. That these sensations would make their appearance in due course was, however, a matter of which we could be certain. Shackleton's description of his search on the plateau, when headache of the most violent and unpleasant kind was the order of the day, was fresh in the memory of all of us. In a comparatively short time we reached the ledge of the glacier that we had noticed a long way off. It was not quite flat, but sloped slightly towards the edge. When we came to the place to which the Hansen and Jalen had carried their reconnaissance on the previous evening, we had a very fine prospect of the further course of the glacier. To continue along, it was an impossibility. It consisted here, between the two vast mountains, of nothing but crevices after crevices, so huge and ugly that we were forced to conclude that our further advance that way was barred. Over the Fridjof Nansen we could not go. This mountain here rose perpendicularly in parts quite bare and formed with the glacier a surface so wild and cut up that all thoughts of crossing the ice field in that direction had to be instantly abandoned. Our only chance lay in the direction of Don Pedro Cristoforison. Here, so far as we could see, the connection of the glacier and the land offered possibilities of further progress. Without interruption, the glacier was merged in the snow-clad mountainside which rose rapidly towards the partially bare summit. Our view, however, did not extend very far. The first part of the mountainside was soon bounded by a lofty ridge running east and west in which we could see huge gaps here and there. From the place where we were standing we had the impression that we should be able to continue our course up there under the ridge between these gaps and thus come out beyond the disturbed track of glacier. We might possibly succeed in this but we could not be certain until we were up on the ridge itself. We took a little rest, it was not a long one, and then started. We were impatient to see whether we could get forward up above. There could be no question of reaching the height without double teams. First we had to get Hansen's and Wisting's sledges up, and then the two others. We were not particularly keen on thus covering the ground twice, but the conditions made it imperative. 
we should have been pleased just then if we had known that this was to be the last ascent that would require double teams, but we did not know this, and it was more than any of us dared to hope. The same hard work and the same trouble to keep the dogs at an even pace, and then we were up under the ridge amongst the open chasms. To go farther without a careful examination of the ground was not to be thought of. Doubtless our day's march had not been a particularly long one, but the peace we had covered had indeed been fatiguing enough. We therefore camped and set our tent at an altitude of 5,650 feet above the sea. We at once proceeded to reconnoiter, and the first thing to be examined was the way we had seen from below. This led in the right direction, that is, in the direction of the glacier, east and west, and was thus the shortest. But it is not always the shortest way that is the best. Here, in any case, it was to be hoped that another and longer one would offer better conditions. The shortest way was awful possibly not altogether impracticable, if no better was to be found. First we had to work our way across a hard, smooth slope which formed an angle of 45 degrees and ended in a huge, bottomless chasm. It was no great pleasure to cross over here on ski, but with heavily laden sledges the enjoyment would be still less. The prospect of seeing sledge, driver, and dog slide down sideways and disappear into the abyss was a great one. We got across with whole skins on ski and continued our exploration. The mountainside along which we were advancing gradually narrowed between vast fissures above and vaster fissures below and finally passed by a very narrow bridge hardly broader than the sledges, into the glacier. On each side of the bridge, one looked down into a deep blue chasm. To cross here did not look very inviting. No doubt we could take the dogs out and haul the sledges over, and thus manage it, presuming the bridge held. But our further progress, which would have to be made on the glacier, would apparently offer many surprises of an unpleasant kind. It was quite possible that, with time and patience, one would be able to tack through the apparently endless succession of deep crevices, but we should first have to see whether something better than this could not be found in another direction. We therefore returned to camp. Here, in the meantime, everything had been put in order, the tent set up and the dogs fed. Now came the great question. What was there on the other side of the ridge? Was it the same desperate confusion, or were the ground off of better facilities? Three of us went off to sea. Excitement rose as we neared the saddle, so much depended on finding a reasonable way. One more pull, and we were up. It was worth the trouble. The first glance showed us that this was the way we had to go. The mountainside ran smooth and even under the lofty summit like a gabled church tower of Mount Don Pedro Christofferson and followed the direction of the glacier. We could see the place where this long even surface united with the glacier. To all appearance it was free from disturbance. We saw some crevices of course but they were far apart and did not give us the idea that they would be a hindrance. But we were still too far from the spot to be able to draw any certain conclusions as to the character of the ground. We therefore set off towards the bottom to examine the conditions more closely. The surface was loose up there and the snow fairly deep. Our ski slipped over it well, but it would be heavy for dogs. We advanced rapidly and soon came to the huge crevices. They were big enough and deep enough, but so scattered that, without much trouble, we could find a way between them. The hollow between the two mountains, which was filled by the Heiberg Glacier, grew narrower and narrower towards the end, 
and although appearances were still very pleasant, I expected to find some disturbance when we arrived at the point where the mountainside passed into the glacier. But my fears proved groundless. By keeping right under Don Pedro, we went clear of all trouble, and in a short time to our great joy, we found ourselves above and beyond that chaotic part of the Heiberg Glacier, which had completely barred our progress. Up here all was strangely peaceful. The mountainside and the glacier united in a great flat terrace, a plain, one might call it, without disturbance of any kind. We could see depressions in the surface where the huge crevices had formerly existed, but now they were entirely filled up and formed one with a surrounding level. We could now see right to the end of this mighty glacier and form some idea of its proportions. Mount Willem Christofferson and Mount Ole Engelstad form the end of it. These two beehive-shaped summits, entirely covered with snow, towered high into the sky. We understood now that the last of the ascent was before us, and that what we saw in the distance between these two mountains was the great plateau itself. The question then was to find a way up and to conquer this last obstruction in the easiest manner. In the radiantly clear air we could see the smallest details with our excellent prismatic glasses and make our calculations with great confidence. It would be possible to clamber up Don Pedro himself. We had done things as difficult before. But here the side of the mountain was fairly steep and full of big crevices and a fearful quantity of gigantic blocks of ice. Between Don Pedro and Willem Christofferson, an arm of the glacier went up on to the plateau, but it was so disturbed and broken up that it could not be used. Between Willem Christofferson and Ole Engelstad, there was no means of getting through. Between Ole Engelstad and Fritjof Nansen, on the other hand, it looked more promising, but as yet the first of these mountains obstructed our view so much that we could not decide with certainty. We were all three rather tired, but agreed to continue our excursion and find out what was here concealed. Our work today would make our progress tomorrow so much easier. We therefore went on and laid our course straight over the topmost flat terrace of the Heiberg Glacier. As we advanced, the ground between Nansen and Engelstadt opened out more and more, and without going any farther, we were able to decide from the formations that here we should undoubtedly find the best way up. If the final ascent at the end of the glacier, which was only partially visible, should present difficulties, we could make out from where we stood that it would be possible, without any great trouble, to work our way over the upper end of the Nansen Mountain itself, which here passed into the plateau by a not-too-difficult glacier. Yes, now we were certain that it was indeed the great plateau and nothing else that we saw before us. In the pass between the two mountains and some little distance within the plateau, Helen Hansen showed up, a very curious peak to look at. It seemed to stick its nose up through the plateau and no more. Its shape was long and it reminded one of nothing so much as the ridge of a roof. Although this peak was thus only just visible, it stood at 11,000 feet above the sea. After we had examined the conditions here and found out that on the following day, if the weather permitted, we should reach the plateau, we turned back, well satisfied with the result of our trip. We all agreed that we were tired and longing to reach camp and get some food. The place where we turned was, according to the aneroid, 8,000 feet above the sea. We were therefore 2,500 feet higher than our tent down on the hillside. Going down in our old tracks was easier work, 
though the return journey was somewhat monotonous. In many places the slope was rapid, and not a few fine runs were made. On approaching our camping ground we had the sharpest descent, and here, reluctant as we might be, we found it wiser to put both our poles together and form a strong break. We came down smartly enough all the same. It was a grand and imposing sight we had when we came out on the ridge under which, far below, our tent stood. Surrounded on all sides by huge crevices and gaping chasms, it could not be said that the site of our camp looked very inviting. The wildness of the landscape seen from this point is not to be described, Chasm after chasm, crevice after crevice, with great blocks of ice scattered promiscuously about, gave one the impression that here nature was too powerful for us. Here no progress was to be thought of. It was not without a certain satisfaction that we stood there and contemplated the scene. The little dark speck down there, our tent, in the midst of this chaos, gave us the feeling of strength and power. We knew in our hearts that the ground would have had to be ugly indeed if we were not to maneuver our way across it and find a place for that little home of ours. Crash upon crash, roar upon roar, met our ears. Now it was a shot from Mount Hanson, now from one of the others. We could see the clouds of snow rise high in the air. It was evident that these mountains were throwing off their winter mantles and putting on a more spring-like garb. We came at a tearing pace down to the tent where our companions had everything in most perfect order. The dogs lay snoring in the heat of the sun and hardly condescended to move when we came scuttling in among them. Inside the tent a regular tropical heat prevailed. The sun was shining directly on to the red cloth and warming it. The premise hummed and hissed, and the pemmican pot fumbled and spurted. We desired nothing better in the world than to get in, fling ourselves down, eat, and drink. The news we brought was no trifling matter, the plateau tomorrow. It sounded almost too good to be true. We had reckoned that it would take us ten days to get up, and now we should do it in four. In this way we saved a great deal of dog food, as we should be able to slaughter the superfluous animals six days earlier than we had calculated. It was quite a little feast that evening in the tent. Not that we had any more to eat than usual, we could not allow ourselves that, but the thought of the fresh dog cutlets that awaited us when we got to the top made our mouths water. In course of time we had so habituated ourselves to the idea of the approaching slaughter that this event did not appear to us so horrible as it would otherwise have done. <clears throat> Judgment had already been pronounced, and a selection made of those who were worthy of prolonged life and those who were to be sacrificed. This had been, I may add, a difficult problem to solve, so efficient were they all. The rumblings continued all night, and one avalanche after another exposed parts of the mountain sides that had been concealed from time immemorial. The following day, November 20, we were up and away at the usual time, about 8 a.m. The weather was splendid, calm, and clear. Getting up over the saddle was a rough beginning of the day for our dogs, and they gave a good account of themselves pulling the sledges up with single teams this time. The going was heavy as on the preceding day, and our advance through the loose snow was not rapid. We did not follow our tracks of the day before, but laid our course directly for the place where we had decided to attempt the ascent. As we approached Mount Ole Engelstad, under which we had to pass in order to come to the arm of the glacier between it and Mount Nansen, our excitement began to rise. What does the end look like? Does the glacier go smoothly on into the plateau, or is it broken up and impassable? We rounded Mount Engelstadt more and more. 
wider and wider grew the opening. The surface looked extremely good as it gradually came into view, and it did not seem as though our assumption of the previous day would be put to shame. At last the whole landscape opened out, and without obstruction of any kind whatever, the last part of the ascent lay before us. It was both long and steep from the look of it, and we agreed to take a little rest before beginning the final attack. We stopped right under Mount Engelstad in a warm and sunny place and allowed ourselves on this occasion a little lunch, an indulgence that had not hitherto been permitted. The cooking case was taken out, and soon the primus was humming in a way that told us it would not be long before the chocolate was ready. It was heavenly treat, that drink. We had all walked ourselves warm, and our throats were as dry as tinder. The contents of the pot were served round by the cook, Hanson. It was no use asking him to share alike. He could not be persuaded to take more than half of what was due to him. The rest he had to divide among his comrades. The drink he had prepared this time was what he, he called chocolate, but I had some difficulty in believing him. He was economical, was Hansen, and permitted no extravagance that could be seen very well by his chocolate. Well, after all, to people who are accustomed to regard bread and water as a luxury, it tasted, as I have said, heavenly. It was the liquid part of the lunch that was served extra. If anyone wanted something to eat, he had to provide it himself. Nothing was offered him. Happy was he who had saved some biscuits from his breakfast. Our halt was not a very long one. It is a queer thing that, when only one has on light under clothing and windproof overalls, one cannot stand still for long without feeling cold. Although the temperature was no lower than minus four degrees Fahrenheit, we were glad to be on the move again. The last ascent was fairly hard work, especially the first half of it. We never expected to do it in, with single teams, but tried it all the same. For this last pull-up I must give the highest praise to both the dogs and their drivers. It was a brilliant performance on both sides. I can still see the situation clearly before me. The dog seemed positively to understand that this was the last big effort that was ahead of them. They lay flat down and hauled, dug their claws in and dragged themselves forward. But they had to stop and get breath pretty often, and then the driver's strength was put to the test. It is no child's play to set a heavenly laden slench, sledge in motion time after time. How they toiled! men and beasts up that slope, but they got on, inch by inch, until the steepest part was behind them. Before them lay the rest of the ascent in a gentle rise, up which they could drive without a stop. It was stiff, nevertheless, and it took a long time before we were all up on the plateau on the southern side of Mount Engelstad. We were very curious and anxious to see what the plateau looked like. We had expected a great level plain extending boundlessly toward the south, but in this we were disappointed. Toward the southwest it looked very level and fine, but that was not the way we had to go. Towards the south the ground continued to rise in long ridges, running east and west, probably a continuation of the mountain chain running to the southeast, or a connection between it and the plateau. We stubbornly continued our march. We would not give in until we had the plain itself before us. Our hope was that the ridge projecting from Mount Don Pedro Christofferson would be the last. We now had it before us. The going changed at once up here. The loose snow disappeared, and a few wind waves began to show themselves. These were especially unpleasant to deal with on this last ridge. They lay from southeast to northwest and were as hard as flint and as sharp as knives. 
a fall among them might have had very serious consequences. One would have thought the dogs had had enough work that day to tire them, but this last ridge, with its unpleasant snow waves, did not seem to trouble them in the least. We all drove up gaily toward the sledges, or towed by the sledges, on to what looked to us like the final plateau, and halted at 8 p.m. The weather had held fine, and we would apparently see a very long way. In the far distance, extending to the northwest, rose peak after peak. This was the chain of mountains running to the southeast, which we had saw from the other side. In our own vicinity, on the other hand, we saw nothing but the backs of the mountains so frequently mentioned. We afterwards learned how deceptive the light can be. I consulted the aneroid immediately on our arrival at the camping ground, and it showed 10,920 feet above the sea, which the, the hypsometer afterwards confirmed. All the sledge meters gave 17 geographical miles, or 31 kilometers, 19 and a quarter statute miles. This day's work, 19 and a quarter miles, with an ascent of 5,750 feet, gives us some idea of what can be performed by dogs in good training. Our sledges still had what might be considered heavy loads, it seems superfluous to give the animals any other testimonial than the bare fact. It was difficult to find a place for the tent, so hard was the snow up here. We found one, however, and set the tent. Sleeping bags and kit bags were handed in to me as usual, through the tent door, and I arranged everything inside. The cooking case and the necessary provisions for that evening and the next morning were also passed in, but the part of my work that went more quickly than usual that night was getting the Primus started and pumping it up to high pressure. I was hoping thereby to produce enough noise to deaden the shots that I knew would soon be heard. Twenty-four of our brave companions and faithful helpers were marked out for death. It was hard, but it had to be so. We had agreed to shrink from nothing in order to reach our goal. Each man was to kill his own dogs to the number that had been fixed. The pemmican was cooked remarkably quickly that evening, and I believe I was unusually industrious in stirring it. There went the first shot. I am not a nervous man, but I must admit that I gave a start. Shot now followed upon shot. They had an uncanny sound over the great plain. A trusty servant lost his life each time. It was long before the first man reported that he had finished. They were all to open their dogs and take out the entrails to prevent the meat being contaminated. The entrails were for the most part devoured warm on the spot by the victim's comrades. So voracious were they all. Sujin, one of the Wisting's dogs, was especially eager for warm entrails. After enjoying this luxury, he could be seen staggering about in a quiet, misshapen condition. Many of the dogs would not touch them at first, but their appetite came after a while. The holiday humor that ought to have been prevailed in the tent that evening, our first on the plateau, did not make its appearance. There was depression and sadness in the air. We had grown so fond of our dogs. The place was named the Butcher's Shop. It had been arranged that we should stop here two days to rest and eat dog. There was more than one among us who at first would not hear of taking any part in this feast. But as time went by and appetites became sharper, this view underwent a change until... During the last few days before reaching the butcher's shop, we all thought and talked of nothing but dog cutlets, dog steaks, and the like. But on this first evening, we put a restraint on ourselves. We thought we could not fall upon our four-footed friends and devour them before they had had time to grow cold. <laughs>
we quickly found out that the butcher's shop was not a hospitable locality. During the night the temperature sank and violent gusts of wind swept over the plain. They shook and tore at the tent, but it would take more than that to get a hold of it. The dogs spent the night in eating. We could hear the crunching and grinding of their teeth whenever we were awake for a moment. The effect of the great and sudden change of altitude made itself felt at once. When I wanted to turn around in my bag, I had to do it a bit at a time so as not to get out of breath. That my comrades were affected in the same way I knew without asking them. My ears told me enough. It was calm when we turned out, but the weather did not look altogether promising. It was overcast and threatening. We occupied the forenoon in flaying a number of dogs. As I have said, all the survivors were not yet in a mood for dog's flesh, and it therefore had to be served in the most enticing form. When flayed and cut up, it went down readily all along the line. Even the most fastidious then overcame their scruples. But with the skin on, we should not have been able to persuade them all to eat that morning. Probably this distaste was due to the smell clinging to the skins, and I must admit that it was not appetizing. The meat itself, as it lay there, cut up, looked well enough, and all conscious. No butcher's shop could have exhibited a finer sight than we showed after flaying and cutting up ten dogs. Great masses of beautiful fresh red meat, with quantities of the most tempting fat, lay spread over the snow. The dogs went around and sniffed at it. Some helped themselves to a piece. Others were digesting. We men had picked out what we thought was the youngest and tenderest ones for ourselves. The whole arrangement was left to whisting, both the selection and the preparation of the cutlets. His choice fell upon Rex, a beautiful little animal, one of his own dogs, by the way. With the skill of an expert, he hacked and cut away what he considered could be sufficient for a meal. I could not take my eyes off his work. The delicate little cutlets had an absolutely hypnotizing effect as they were spread out one by one over the snow. They recalled memories of old days, when no doubt a dog cutlet would have been less tempting than now, memories of dishes on which the cutlets were elegantly arranged side by side with paper frills on the bones and a neat pile of petits pois in the middle. Ah, my thoughts wandered still farther afield, but that does not concern us now, nor has it anything to do with the South Pole. I was aroused from my musings by Wisting digging his axe into the snow as a sign that his work was done, after which he picked up the cutlets and went into the tent. The clouds had dispersed somewhat, and from time to time the sun appeared, though not in its most genial aspect. We succeeded in catching it just in time to get our latitude determined, 85 degrees, 36 minutes south. We were lucky, as not long after the wind got up from the east, southeast, and before we knew what was happening, everything was in a cloud of snow. But now we snapped our fingers at the weather. What difference did it make to us if the wind howled and the guy ropes and the snow drifted? We had, in any case, made up our minds to stay here for a while, and we had food in abundance. We knew the dogs thought much the same so long as we have enough to eat. Let the weather go hang. Inside the tent, Wisting was getting on well when we came in after making these observations. The pot was on, and to judge by the savory smell, the preparations were already far advanced. The cutlets were not fried. We had neither frying pan nor butter. We could no doubt have got some lard out of the pemmican, and we might have contrived some sort of a pan so that we could have fried them if it had been necessary but we found it far easier and quicker to boil them, and in this way we got excellent soup into the bargain. Wisting knew his business surprisingly well. He had put into the soup all those parts of the pemmican that 
contained most vegetables, and now he served us the finest fresh meat soup with vegetables in it. The clue of the repast was the dish of cutlets. If we had entertained the slightest doubt of the quality of the meat, this vanished instantly on the first trial. The meat was excellent, quite excellent, and one cutlet after another disappeared with lightning-like rapidity. I must admit that they would have lost nothing by being a little more tender but one must not expect too much of a dog. At this first meal I finished five cutlets myself and looked in vain in the pot for more. Worsting appeared not to have reckoned on such a brief demand. We employed the afternoon in going through our stock of provisions and dividing the whole of it among three sledges. The fourth, Hassel's, was to be left behind. The provisions were thus provide, divided. Sledge number one, Wistings, contained biscuits, 3,700, daily ration, 40 biscuits per man. Dogs, pemmican, 277, three-quarter pounds, a half a kilogram of one pound, one and a half ounces per dog per day. Men's pemmican, 59 and a half pounds, 350 grams, or 12.34 ounces per man per day. Chocolate, 12 three-quarter pounds, 40 grams, or 1.4 ounces per man per day. Milk powder, 13 and a quarter pounds, 60 grams, or 2.1 ounces per man per day. The other two sledges had approximately the same supplies, and thus permitted us on leaving this place to extend our march over a period of 60 days with full rations. Our 18 surviving dogs were divided into three teams, six in each. According to our calculation, we ought to be able to reach the pole from here with these 18 and to leave it again with 16. Hassel, who was to leave his sledge at this point, thus concluded his provision account and the divided provisions were entered in the books of the three others. All this, then, was done that day on paper. It remained to make the actual transfer of provisions later, when the weather permitted. To go out and do it that afternoon was not advisable. Next day, November 23rd, the wind had gone round to the northeast with comparatively manageable weather, so at seven in the morning we began to repack the sledges. This was not an altogether pleasant task. Although the weather was what I have called comparatively manageable, it was very far from being suitable for packing provisions. The chocolate, which by this time consisted chiefly of very small pieces, had to be taken out, counted, and then divided among the three sledges. The same with the biscuits. Every single biscuit had to be taken out and counted, and as we had some thousands of them to deal with, it would readily be understood that it was to stand there in about minus four degrees Fahrenheit and a gale of wind, most of the time with bare hands, fumbling over this troublesome occupation. The wind increased while we were at work, and when at last we had finished, the snow was so thick that we could scarcely see the tent. End of section 23, recording by Dick Durrett, Manchester, New Hampshire.